Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering here in the name of your Son, counting on and so grateful for the promise that you make that when we gather in your name, you are here in our midst. So we do pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds, God, to your presence and that which you desire to accomplish as we gather this morning in the name of Jesus. And so we yield to your authority and ask, O oh Father, that you would do what you desire. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. When I first got here before the service started, I was walking up the side aisle and I turned and I saw that pile of Bibles presently to your eyes hiding behind uh, the flower arrangement, eight of them. And the whole time each of them were being presented at the beginning of the service, I kept going, eight, eight. And, and not just eight as it represents the Diocese of Central Florida, but a service that God is providing for the church in raising up men and women, not just for the Diocese of Central Florida, but here today, Chicago, Louisville, Baton Rouge, Chevy Chase, Maryland, and God knows where you all are going to go. I mean, a part of the sense of what it means to be ordained is that you're really ordained for the whole church, it, which you could end up anywhere on this planet. So that, for example, when Robert Osborne, one of the people here, talked to me at one point about the possibility of going to Cairo, I was not surprised. Because, you see, God has a passion to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the whole world see and know, it said in the collect, that things which were cast down are being raised up. Things that had grown old are being made new. And that all things, not just what we like, not just our culture, not just our friends and acquaintances, but all of it is being brought, they are being brought to their perfection by him. Now, that's what we get to be a part of, to be a channel that somehow God uses to express that work of things being raised up as a witness and sign, not just to us insiders who have already said yes to Jesus, but literally to the world that something new is happening. It starts in the heart of each one of us. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see that we who had, according to 2 Corinthians, been blinded by the God of this world to keep us from seeing the light of the gospel, God broke in and said, no, Satan does not have the last word, I do, and God breaks in with his light so that in a whole new way we see that the whole question about who God is and how God operates is literally manifested, as the scripture says, in the face of his son that he is God's final answer for all theology, for all questions about what it means to be both God and to be human. That he is, as he said, the way, the truth, and the light. And therefore, we say without reservation that our allegiance is to him more than just the allegiance of our will, the allegiance of all that we are, that we say because we are His and because He has bought us with such a dear price, literally the blood of His Son, the death and resurrection of Jesus, applied and made manifest here, here, that we would say never to any invitation to walk away from Him. 
no matter how sweet that invitation may seem, because we understand that no matter how sweet the voice of that invitation is, it finds its source in the God of this world who is committing, committed to blinding us to the authority of the gospel. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Instead, what's happened is, is that God, by His mercy, has pulled the curtain back. He has shown us the unseen in a way that we would never, ever have known without Him first coming to us, breaking the bondage of that darkness and opening our eyes and creating room in our hearts to hear the very voice of God. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you and I appointed you. <laughs> we thought we had a plan for our lives. We thought we knew what we were going to be doing. I don't know what any of you said when you were children. Well, what are you going to be when you grow up? But very few of us ever said, oh, I'm going to be ordained. <laughs> I, I still remember, my kids now laugh about this, but we would often have people at our dinner table. And so here we are gathered in the dining room with all of our kids, all five of them, and two or three guests, and inevitably, the question would come up. Well, are any of you going to follow in your father's footsteps? They just stared at their plates. <laughs> it's not on our screens. In fact, I, I still remember when people started coming to me and saying, have you ever thought of being ordained? I thought that was the silliest thing I'd ever heard of. I, I must confess to you, I did not have a high view of clergy. What I didn't know that was that God was laughing. But you see, I couldn't see. I couldn't see. I had my mind on entirely different things, not knowing that the lure of those things was in fact the work of the enemy in my life to draw me away from faithfulness to Jesus. Nobody told me that. And in fact, because we live in a world, because Satan is the god of this world, we live in a world that applauds what they describe as virtues and values that really are completely in contradiction to the gospel of the kingdom of God. And there is always that temptation to find a way to somehow lessen the friction, the inevitable friction between what it means to be a Christian who is committed to living out her or his faith in a world that stands, in fact, in opposition to it, though they might hunger for it. That's why the warnings that are in the Scriptures again and again and again, including our lesson that somehow we need to be prepared for the fact that we should be, to quote the Gospel reading for this morning, dressed, meaning like ready for battle. Not ready for battle to be combative, but ready for battle knowing that the work in the unseen is a work primarily of intercession, and then out of that intercession expressed in a life of abject servanthood. So long and whenever the church has ever tried to claim power for herself, inevitably they come under the influence of those values that look like the God of this world rather than the radical servanthood of Jesus. And one of the reasons we live in this age in an extraordinary crisis of confidence, a lack of confidence in our religious leaders is the fact that somehow what has creeped in sometimes just walked right in, is a commitment to things that do not look like Jesus Christ. And I hope you know this, none of us are immune. There's no such thing as a them. We are one body. And so if any of you are taking cold comfort that somehow the scandal hit Roman Catholicism, but it hasn't touched the Episcopal Church yet. Ooh, be careful, be careful. If you stand, lest you fall. 
It should serve to any Christian leader as a, a severe warning. It is in contradiction to what it means to be a slave, because you see, that's the call. The call, so specific in the epistle lesson, is a call to slavery, a very uncomfortable word. But it is a slavery to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to serve, above all, the men and women that God has sent our way, the children, the elderly, and the whole list of what was given in the litany for ordinations, from the poor to the persecuted to the people in public trust, the entire literally panoply of humanity is laid out in that litany because that, in fact, is the field. Let the whole world see and know the things which were cast down are being raised up. And so there's a kind of clarity to the job description. I'm here to be available for Jesus to use me as Jesus so chooses for the sake of the fact that by God's mercy, by something that I might pray or say or show, that they might in, le be led in some way or in some deeper way into the knowledge of the glory of the Son of God. You see, without that kind of inner direction, Stanley Hauerwas has a phrase for it. There is among some clergy what he described this quivering mass of availability. In other words, that anybody is sort of at your beck and call, and you could get a call any time, day and night. And while that is true, and you darn well better answer the phone, the fact of the matter is, is that you are under the direction of Jesus far more, and with a very specific kind of intent. Because, you see, in this world that desires to be profoundly loved and to be cared for, and sees the church, and appropriately, as a place where that care is manifested and happened. Sometimes care looks like challenge. Sometimes care looks like an invitation to join in servanthood. Sometimes care looks like a call to sacrifice that befits the name slave which is what all of us in Corinthians are called, without exception, not just the leaders. And we who are men and women who really want to live at the beck and call of the God of convenience are always shaken up by the fact that things are happening that feel profoundly outside of our control. We don't like interruptions, right? Are you there? And yet God is shaping and working in us a kind of profound brokenness even to our own expectations that he might even more faithfully flow through us that these cracked bot earthen vessels might be those that God uses so that the light might shine, so that they might see and know. This is a really hard life. Honestly, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I'm really glad that my sons looked at their plates, because there is a real count the cost that is a part of this, and it is not small. You will find yourself subject to every single expectation, both in the parish as well as in society, much of whom are not, most of which are really not appropriate. And it takes a kind of inner clarity that only can come, quite frankly, by being alone with the Scripture, letting the Word of God form you and shape you listening to people who have made commitments to Jesus from whom you can learn. It's what the Scripture calls that which we have received, the faith of the apostles. 
and to learn from them who lived in very similar circumstances how to express the gospel in the kind of climate in which we find ourselves, particularly if you're in one of those portions of the church to describe that Timothy says has gone after another gospel that are itching ears looking for something to satisfy the thing that they crave for that cannot be found in the Word of God. It's not easy, but it is critically important. And here's the wonder of it. I don't want this to sound too bleak, because I, I, I want you to know, I wouldn't do anything else for the world. I get, and so will you, get to be involved in some of the most tender moments that you can ever share with another human being, where they, because they trust you, begin to open their hearts, sometimes to things that they've never told anyone, because they are, in fact, even if the price is high, hunger to hear a word that speaks forgiveness, mercy, and even vocation and purpose. And they're trusting you to come to them and be open to them without your quote-unquote agenda, but a willingness instead to genuinely hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. You get to be a part of God moving in the most phenomenal ways because you see a part of what God does is that occasionally it's public and it's big and everybody gets to see it, but more often than not it's hidden. The miracles are not on view. Cast not your pearls before swine is kind of what Jesus does with his own miracles. He sort of opens them up to the people who need them most and most people never ever see or know. But you do as God begins to allow you to be a vessel through whom those things are manifested. So there's great joy in it. I mean, there, I mean, there is great joy. Not the least of which, as God begins to mine your own heart and work in you a greater level of dependence upon His Holy Spirit, a willingness to say yes to hard things that you never thought that you could do to know a depth of the companionship of His presence, even in the deep, deep, dry seasons that come upon all of us, to know that you are appointed. Appointed. Wasn't your idea? You were appointed. So, you're appointed on the one hand to slavery. You are appointed on the one hand to tribulation. You are appointed on the one hand always bearing in our body the dying of our Lord Jesus. And you're also appointed to the power of God touching your lips. You're appointed to God working new things in your soul. You are appointed to be raised up by Him because you are one of the ones who had been cast down, who are being raised up. You are one of the ones who walk with a sense of poise and purpose because even though the armor that's on you doesn't always feel particularly comfortable and you're praying that God points you in the right direction, you are continuing to move forward because there is something happening in you and through you that literally matters for all of eternity. Why would you not want to be a part of that? So, Deacons, express to the rest of us that kind of servanthood, that kind of slavery. Continue to open wide the doors of the church to know that the purpose is that the whole world might see and know rather than just we feeling better about ourselves. Let them know that somehow that even in the ordinary work of life, God is present. And he desires to do things above and beyond anything that we could ever ask or imagine. Don't be afraid to renounce the gods of this world. Do not be afraid to call out those parts of us that really are abandoning the gospel for something else, the itching ears, the desire for cravings. It happens, it happens to the best of us. All of us wrestle with these issues of compromise, where and how. It's complicated. You need Jesus to do this. But the glory is, He will give you what you need. The glory is, the flow of the life of God is the sweetest thing you will ever know. 
the glory of it is, you are being changed. And God will use you to be a vessel through which others are changed as well. So come on. Let's do this. Let's say yes to what God is doing in our lives, not shrink back. And so that at the end, we may stand up and with the most profound sense of gratitude, knowing that we didn't deserve any of it. Oh, thank you, God, for calling me, for saying yes to me, that I might say yes to you. Amen.